Hey guys, Miss Marisic here, and in this video I'm going to talk to you all about mass spectroscopy. Now, I know most of us are familiar with average atomic mass, that basically it is a weighted average of isotope samples of a particular element taken from all over the Earth, and we've analyzed those samples to determine the masses of isotopes that are present, as well as their fraction abundance. Um, we've then multiplied those values together, added them up, and that gets us that weighted average that atomic mass would be. So for example, for magnesium, they've taken samples of magnesium from all over the earth, analyzed it to figure out what isotopes are present, what the masses are, what the fraction abundances would be, and then they've taken that weighted average and obtained it to be 24.30. So here's the big question then. How do we get this fraction abundance and mass isotope information. Where does that come from? And that's where mass spectroscopy comes into play. Um, mass spec machines are fairly large and expensive. Um, high schools don't have them because they're so expensive. Um, but you might see one in college, like in an upper level chemistry lab. Um, but basically what you do is you put your element sample into the machine and it analyzes it for you and gives you this information. Now before we take the time to look at some graphs to kind of you know see how to read them, I want you to have an understanding of how the internal mechanics of the machine work. So if you notice down here we have a picture of kind of like the process that takes place for a mass spec machine and down here is kind of a matching component that each of these uh, matches up with one of the pictures up here. So the A, B, C, D, E matches up with the spaces down here. So what I want you to do is to take a moment and pause the video and see if you can match up these letters with these descriptions. So pause the video, try them out. Did you pause the video? Hopefully you've paused the video, you've tried them out. Um, we're gonna go through and I'm gonna kind of explain these different steps now. Um, so the first step that you see right here is what happens right after you put your sample into the machine and you start to run it. What the machine will do is it'll heat it to vaporize it. So basically, like you put your sample of the element in there, heats it up really hot, and what it will do is it'll convert it into individual gaseous atoms. Uh, the next step is this guy right here. High voltage electric current is passed through the gaseous atoms. Um, what that will do is this step right here the electric current will knock off electrons and change them into positively charged cations. So you can notice here as we run that electricity through, you notice that now our little elements have those plus signs on them. So those are our cations that are now running through this machine. The next step is that a series of negatively charged rings accelerate the positively charged cations. So basically the attraction of these rings helps to kind of pull them through and causes those cations to speed up. Uh, the next step is this guy. The beam of ions is then passed through two rotating discs with staggered slits. The part of the machine allows only ions with sufficient velocity to make it through. So what that means is that we want cations that are moving very fast. If they're not moving fast enough, what happens is that this next step doesn't work properly. Um, the deflection doesn't happen on the next step. Um, so this, this step E here just to, ensures that our particles are moving at particular speeds and any slower ones will get dropped off by the wayside. Um, our next step is that the beam of cations is then passed between two oppositely charged parallel plates. Now I want to talk about this step for just a moment. We have these positively charged cations that were running through these two plates. Bottom plate has a positive charge to it, top plate has a negative charge. Remember, like charges repel, so these positives are going to deflect away from this positive plate, but they're going to attract toward the negative plate. However, because we have all of an element together, we have all kinds of different massed isotopes in the sample. So yes, they're all cations, but all, each of those cations has a different mass. And so they're going to be deflected ever so slightly differently depending on what their mass is. So our next step here G. The cations are deflected toward the negative plate, as we already mentioned, but the lighter ones get deflected more and hit the plate sooner, while the heavier ones have more momentum and hit the plate further down. So those light ones kind of 
ping up almost automatically, whereas those heavier ones kind of take a while to like get their way up. So our last step here, step H, particle detectors keep count and translate the information into a bar graph. So let me kind of explain what happens here. On this plate, we have sensors. And what the sensors do is they say, hey, I have X number of particles hitting this spot, and this spot represents a mass of 67. But then I have more particles hitting this spot on the plate, which represents a mass of 70. So each spot on the plate gets counted how many particles are hitting in that particular spot. And by what spot they're hitting, we know what the mass is. So then that ends up creating this lovely graph of information that we see up here. Okay, we notice for this particular sample that they ran through, we have one, two, three isotopes due to the three different peaks. One has a, and by the way, these are our mass numbers. So one, has a, one isotope has a mass of 67, another has a mass of 70, another has a mass of 72. But also we are measuring here the percent abundance. Okay, so each height on this peak is representing how many particles are hitting. We had a lot of mass at 70 hitting, but only a little bit at 72 and kind of in between at 67. So we now have that information we're looking for, the mass of the isotope in the fraction abundance. So now for this sample, we could go calculate what its average atomic mass would be. And this is done for samples all over the earth for each of the elements on the periodic table. Now, we can go ahead and, and do our calculations since we have exact numbers here, but we can also kind of make some approximations, quick estimates about average atomic mass just having this graph. If you think about it for just a minute, we know we have a lot of mass of 70 hitting this plate, a little bit of 72 and a little bit more of 67. So it's likely that our average atomic mass is close to 70, but maybe a little less because this peak is fairly high and it's several, um, you know, it's several mass units lower um, than 70. So there's a chance that we might be a little bit below 70. So if I wanted to kind of approximate what element I think this would be on the periodic table, I would go look at my mass numbers. I'm looking for an element that's around 70, but maybe just a little bit less than 70. And I see, hey, gallium here, 69.72, that's really close to 70, but just a little bit less than it, which would accommodate for that lower peak that we saw. So it's very likely that the sample that was being run through this particular mass spec machine was gallium. So you can see, we could approximate that it was gallium without actually doing a calculation. And that's the kind of questions that um, AP likes to ask a whole bunch. So let's look at the next page. Um, it's got some more examples for us that are very similar to that. So again, we have here some mass spectroscopy data for an element. Um, these are kind of showing you two different formats that our mass spec data could have. Sometimes they'll show us bar graphs for our information, where other times they'll show us kind of a line graph that has peaks. Um, I've seen both of these on questions. It kind of just depends on what you're looking at. So just be prepared to see both, okay? It, it's the same information just being presented two different ways. Um, it says, without using a calculator, what value would the average atomic mass be close to? Well, I could see here that I've got a lot at a mass number of 20 and only a little bit at 21 and 22. So if I had to make a guess, I would say this is really close to 20 for my mass number. And if I go look at my periodic table and I go find an element that's really close to 20, I'm like, well, fluorine's at 19, neon's at 20.18. I know I've got to be close to 20, but I also need to be just a little bit higher than 20 because this 21 and 22 would average in with it. So more than likely, my element here would be neon. Okay, next question says, hey, when a sample of an element is vaporized and ejected into a mass spectrometer, the results shown in the figure I obtained. Use the data to calculate the average atomic mass of the element. So just like we've done before with calculating average atomic mass, I would take um, my uh, percent and convert it into a fraction. So like, for example, here, um, you see they're giving us our mass numbers, but then these guys here are giving us our exact percentages. So for this first isotope, 69.09%, I'd give as 0.6909. My mass number is 63. I'm going to use that since they didn't give me an exact mass. I'm going to add that to 
my 0 0.3091, again, that 30.91% converted into a fraction, multiplied by the mass number of 65. And I would continue to do that for however many isotopes I have. Here I only have the two, so I only had to do it for the two. Um, by the way, this gets an answer of 63.62. And if you wanted, you could go ahead and put atomic mass units with it. Okay, so calculate the average atomic mass. Now ask, what is the most likely identity of the element shown? And this brings up kind of an important point I want to talk about here. Um, if I go look at my periodic table here, I don't see anything that's exactly on the nose 63.62. Uh, the closest thing I see is copper at 63.55. So more than likely, this guy is copper here, okay? But the reason why it doesn't match up exactly is because this information is only for my sample. And the data on the periodic table is for samples all over the Earth. So just keep in mind that this may not perfectly match up with something on the periodic table, but it should be really close. Okay. Now, I've kind of pre-done a little bit of work on this one. Uh, what it, this particular question wants us to do is to actually translate the information over here into a mass spec graph to create a graph based on the information. Okay. Um, first off, it asks, how many peaks will the mass spectrum for lead have? Well, if I have four isotopes of information, then I'm going to have four peaks worth of information, right? Four peaks for the four isotopes. So then it says, draw the mass spectrum for lead based on the data shown. Um, so I've kind of gone ahead and numbered off here my percentages. Um, I also went and put kind of the range of numbers I see here. Now, I went ahead and included 205, even though I don't see a 205 isotope here, just so, so I could show that that number, I wouldn't have a peak for it. So kind of, you know, leaving it as a blank spot. Um, so for 204, I had 1.4. So that's going to be a really low peak here. I'm going to kind of pl place this out here. Um, 206, I have 25. So that's going to be kind of right there. For 207, I had 21.6. So it's going to be a little bit less than that one. Okay. And then for 208, I had 52. It's a little bit higher here than 52. So then what I could do is I could either draw kind of a line with a peak thing like we saw, or I could kind of just bar graph it and kind of color in here to create my mass spec. So there we go. Now, I will warn you, most of the time, these graphs do show percent abundances. So then I could use that information to go and directly calculate average atomic mass. However, every once in a blue moon, our uh, mass spec data, instead of showing percent abundance, shows something instead called intensity. Basically, how intense is the signal? And when our graphs do that, instead of you know our percentages adding up to 100%, the tallest peak will actually have an intensity of 100. So where you have to be careful is if you were asked to actually do a calculation for this particular graph, you could not use these numbers directly as your percentages. What you would have to do is go calculate the fraction involved. Like if I added all these up, 100 plus 8.47 plus 12.68, plus if I put 100 over that number, I could then get what the percent abundance would be or the fraction abundance would be. So just be very careful if you actually had to calculate with something like this. Be careful if you have intensity data or percentage data. And you, again, you should be able to tell really easily whether or not the percents add up to 100 or if you have intensity numbers that are going to be adding up to way above 100. So on this one, it asks, hey, an example of mass spectroscopy data for an element is shown to the right. What is an approximate value for the atomic mass of the element? If I look here at this data, um, I notice some small peaks at like 84, 86, 87. And at this peak, that's representing 88, okay, I see that that peak is huge in comparison to the other ones. That means I have a huge percent of my substance that has a mass number of 88. Um, however, since I have the couple of peaks that are lower than that, I'm going to guess that my value is somewhere really close to 88, but a little bit below because, again, these have to all average together to give me that average atomic mass. So I would guess maybe like 87.9-ish. 
you know, somewhere maybe in that ballpark. And so if I go look at then at my periodic table and go look at something that's maybe in that ballpark, okay, I'm a little off, but that's okay. I, again and again, it might not be perfect for this particular element since I'm looking at just my sample here, but I would guess that my element represented by this particular graph would be strontium. Again, it may not come out perfect because this is for my sample and not necessarily worldwide data for this particular element. Um, hopefully you have a good understanding about mass spec graphs. As you can see, they're pretty easy to use. Um, I actually like mass spec questions because I don't think they're very hard once you kind of understand what you're looking at. Um, but if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. Bye guys.